Graphs are also one of those things that might seem naff on the surface, but they're insanely useful. For example, this shows you why nothing happens if you put a metal fork out in the sun, but sparks will fly if you put it in a microwave. A graph is just a picture that allows us to see a function, an equation that involves two variables. Usually y is on the vertical axis, x on the horizontal. They also both go into negative values, so we have four quadrants where points can be plotted. The first number is always the x value, then the y. Just put a cross where those two meet. Go across first with the x, down the hall as they say, then up with the y, up the stairs. If the equation is linear, that's just x's and y's involved, there's no power on either of them, you will end up with a straight line graph. Of course, if it's just x or y equals something, you just get a vertical or horizontal line. But let's say we have two coordinates, 1, 3 and 3, 7. Let's plot them. If we join these with a straight line and extrapolate the line, extend it, we have our graph. The equation or function for this line is y equals 2x plus 1. For any value of x we put in there, the equation or function tells us what y will be. What is y equal to when x is 1? That's 3. That's why we have a point there. What about when x is 3? y is 7. There's a point there too. In fact, if we plotted every point by changing x and seeing what y is, we'd end up with this line. But we only need two points in order to draw a straight line graph. The general formula or equation for a straight line or linear graph is y equals mx plus c. We already know what y and x are, but what do m and c represent? m is the gradient or slope of the line. This just tells you how far up the line goes every time we go across 1. So you can find the gradient of any line by making a right angle triangle using the line. It doesn't matter how big it is, the gradient is always the height of the triangle divided by its width. Up divided by across, that's change in y divided by change in x. Let's keep it simple though, I've just made it 1 across. So 2 divided by 1 is 2, so the gradient is 2. That's the m in our equation here. We could have also just used our two points we plotted to find the gradient instead. Again, this gives us a gradient of 2. It's constant. Be careful though, if the gradient isn't positive, the line will go down as you go to the right. Technically, in this case, the height of the triangle should be negative to give us that negative value for the gradient. C is the y-intercept. It tells you where the line crosses the y-axis. If this is zero, then the line passes through the origin, zero, zero. Not so here though, we can see that it crosses it at a y-value of one. Again, be careful as the y-intercept could be a negative number. If you have two parallel straight lines, their equations will be different, but their gradients must be the same. That means they'll never meet. If you have two lines that aren't parallel, they must meet at some point. At this point, they have the same values of x and y. That means there is one solution for the two equations. We have simultaneous equations. Two unknowns, x and y, but because we have two equations, we can find a solution. If the two lines are perpendicular, you also know that the gradient is the negative reciprocal of the other. That's because the triangle we would draw for the other one has been rotated 90 degrees, so the height and width have been swapped. It's not 2 over 1, but now 1 over 2. The gradient of this line is a half instead. Well, technically, minus a half or negative half, isn't it? Because the slope is in the opposite direction. Nonlinear graphs are a bit trickier than linear graphs. It's very difficult to determine what the equation is from looking at values on the graph. Take y equals x squared minus 3, for example. When x is 0, y is minus 3. That's our y-intercept. Fine. When x is 1, y is minus 2. When x is minus 1, y is 2 again. This is a quadratic function, therefore. Any value of y is a result of two possible values of x. Quadratic graphs always have one turning point at the lowest or highest point if it's inverted. Sometimes the turning point won't be at an integer value for x. It could be between two integers. If you're higher, you might have to plot the points by using a table of values that you've calculated, then sketch the curve and you can see where the turning point is or what two numbers it's between anyway. You can also have a cubic graph where the equation involves x cubes. Reciprocal graphs are kind of funky. Take y equals 1 over x. It looks like this. It's two separate curves. For higher, an exponential equation involves something to the power of x. Say y equals 2 to the power of x. It looks like this. It always curves upwards with an increasing gradient. We can also draw a sine curve. It starts at 0, goes up to 1 at 90 degrees, 0 at 180 degrees, minus 1 at 270 degrees, then it starts again at 360. That is if y equals just sine x. If it's y equals 2 sine x, all that means is that the height of this wave goes up to 2 instead of 1. A cos or cosine wave is just a sine wave shifted by 90 degrees, so it starts at 1 instead of 0. 
The graph of tan x is a weird one. It just increases to infinity at 90 degrees, then appears at the bottom to carry on the function. Just for higher, the equation for a circle takes the form of x squared plus y squared equals a constant squared. This constant is the radius of the circle. If this looks familiar, that's because this is the equation for a right angled triangle too, which we can draw to show that the hypotenuse is the radius. For higher, you need to know how to find the gradient of the tangent at any point in a circle. The line we can draw to show what the change in gradient is at a particular point. As the hypotenuse of our right angle triangle is perpendicular to this tangent, we just do what we did earlier. Find the gradient of this hypotenuse, don't forget it could be negative, and the gradient of the tangent will be the negative reciprocal of this. Also for higher, you could be asked to draw a translated functional shape. That just means being moved up or down or left or right by so much. This is done algebraically by saying that whatever y is equal to, that's just a function of x, shorthand f brackets x. We say f of x. This function could be x, x squared, 3 root x, whatever the equation actually is. We're just using this as a shortcut. We're just combining it into this f of x. If we say that a graph drawn is showing the function f of x, again it could be any function, then f of x plus 3 means that every y value is increased by 3. It's been translated upwards. To translate sideways along the x-axis, however, we say it's no longer f of x, but f of x plus 2 doesn't mean it moves to the right, but this time it's translated to the left. A minus would translate it to the right. The reason it's different is because this time, in order for y to be equal to f of x plus 2, that means that every x value has to be 2 less than what it was, hence the move to the left. A reflected function is just the result of sticking a minus in front of the function, or the x f of minus x is a reflection in the y-axis, while minus f of x is a reflection in the x-axis. Finally, you have to be able to calculate or estimate the area under a graph. This is also used a lot in physics. For example, finding the area under a speed time graph gives you the total distance travelled. If it consists of straight lines, you can just split the area into triangles and rectangles, etc. Then add up the area of all of these shapes. If it's a curve, however, you need to estimate the area instead. The most accurate way is to count squares, which is a bit of a chore, but to make things easier, you can use double squares, two by two, and count them instead. Count the complete squares first, then count two parts of squares that look like they add up to one. Tally them up and then add them to the total. Then you take that area and multiply by whatever the size of your squares represent.